Hello there, my name's Parth. Now, classical physics, the physics that we basically study in high school, and quantum physics, the study of very small objects, are generally based on pretty different ideas to each other. But both ways of looking at physics, classical and quantum, have the concept of energy in common with each other. In classical physics, energy is a mathematical quantity that allows us to calculate exactly how any particular system that we're studying will change over time. For example, let's say we're studying a snooker or pool ball moving along a table at a certain speed. If the ball happens to collide with another ball on the table, we can use the concept of energy to work out exactly how each ball will behave after the collision. We could say that because the total energy of the system is conserved or stays constant, remember energy is neither created nor destroyed, but can be transferred from one type to another, that the total energy of the balls before the collision must be the same as after the collision. In quantum physics, the concept of energy serves a similar purpose. The law of conservation of energy can still be used, meaning if we're studying any isolated system, then the total energy of that system stays the same over time. A simple example of this is the following. Let's say we have an electron. If this electron gains energy, then this energy would have had to come from somewhere. It could have, for example, been gained because the electron absorbed a photon with the exact right amount of energy. Makes sense, right? Now, this is all well and good, but here's the issue. If we think about different equations for energy in classical physics, they look fairly reasonable and friendly. For example, here's the one for kinetic energy. You take an object's mass and multiply it by the square of the speed with which the object is moving, and then you take this whole thing and you halve it, and voila, you've calculated the kinetic energy of the object. Similarly, with gravitational potential energy, you can take an object's mass and multiply it by the acceleration due to gravity experienced by the object, as well as its height above the ground. And boom, you found the gravitational potential energy. But let's take a look at what we can use to calculate the total energy of any system that we're studying in quantum mechanics. What we want looks something like this. Ugh. Firstly, it's got a partial derivative. Secondly, it's got this quantity, h bar, which is just a constant for our purposes. It's of course a very important constant to quantum mechanics, but for our video, it's just a constant. And thirdly, maybe most importantly of all, there's this i here. The i represents the imaginary number, or the square root of negative one. What the heck? It looks like energy in quantum mechanics is imaginary. Or is it? Well, the answer to this question is directly related to the fact that quantum mechanics, as a theory, regularly deals with a system's wave function. A wave function is basically a mathematical function that contains all the information that we can know about our system. For example, if our system was just a single electron and its wave function looked something like this, then we could use this to tell us how likely we are to find the electron at different points or positions in space if we did an experiment to find its position. To work out these probabilities, what we need to do is to square the wave function. Technically, we're taking its square modulus. This square modulus of the wave function directly corresponds to probability. We're more likely to find our electron here and less likely to find it here in this case because the square of the wave function is smaller in value. And we can do a mathematical transformation on our wave function so that instead of giving the likelihood of finding the electron at different points in space, the wave function will now give us the likelihood of finding the electron with different amounts of energy. Or to put it another way, the likelihood of finding our particle in different energy levels. This is extremely useful when we study electrons in atoms, for example. We can find out whether a particular electron is most likely to be in a high energy state or a low energy state or so on. The point though is that we can use the wave function, if we know it, to find out the probability that our electron has a particular amount of energy. And in the theory of quantum mechanics, the way that we do that, the way that we find out how much energy our electron has, is by applying a measurement operator on our wave function. In this case, of course, we're looking at the total energy operator. And this gives us a clue as to why our energy operator has an imaginary number in it. It's not that the energy of the system itself is imaginary, but rather 
the theoretical equivalent of measuring a particle's energy is applying this operator to its wave function. The result of applying this operator to the wave function is actually the energy of the system. And this energy is very much real. It's not imaginary. Because remember, the whole point of energy is that it's this mathematical concept that allows us to work out how systems should behave and what they will tend to do in any given scenario. So then the question that comes up is, how does an imaginary operator give us a real quantity, which is the energy of the system? Well, the answer to this is that the wave function itself also has some imaginary part. It's a very hand wavy explanation, but that's kind of basically what happens. Overall, applying this operator to the wave function gives us a real value, which is very similar to the classical physics energy that we're already quite familiar with. Here, try this example. Let's say that our wave function looks like this. Notice that it has imaginary bits in it. The exact details don't matter, but what we're working with here is a plane wave. This wave function looks like a wave traveling through a single plane or flat surface without changing direction, hence plane wave. What we're drawing here is just the real part of it, but it also has an imaginary part. Usually wave functions have a real part and an imaginary part, and we can describe them compactly using this notation, for example. What this wave function represents is that the probability of finding our electron is fairly evenly spread out through all of space, though we still have regions of high probability and low probability. Now, this particular thing isn't a physically realistic wave function, because no system will have a perfectly even spread of probability throughout the universe unless it's all zero. But this wave function is the first step to creating more realistic wave functions, so it's useful for us to understand it a little bit. So, if you're familiar with imaginary numbers and differentiation, try to apply the total energy operator to this wave function and see what you get. Hopefully, it should be a real value which represents the energy of the electron. So let's recap. Is energy somehow weird and imaginary in the theory of quantum mechanics? No, the energy operator is, which is the thing that we apply to the wave function, which also necessarily has imaginary parts, but the energy operator is simply our mechanism for finding the energy of the system. In simple terms, when we do an experiment, we find its energy, and the theoretical equivalent of that is applying an energy operator. And hence, energy itself in quantum mechanics is not imaginary, but the operator is. And with all of that being said, I hope you enjoyed this brief look at quantum operators. Check out some more of my videos discussing this topic. I'll link them in the description box down below. And if you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and hit that bell button for more fun physics content. Please also check out my merch. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And lastly, I'd like to say a huge thanks to all of my Giga patrons and all of the others over on my Patreon page. That's also linked in the description box below if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you very soon.